All right, so panel number two is titled Stem Cell Frontiers, Stem Cell Science on an International Space Station, Disease Models, Stem Cell Therapies, and Tissue Engineering. So I'm just going to go over the format again so that everybody has an idea of what to expect. So it's going to be intros followed by three questions. If there's time, bonus questions, final thoughts, and audience Q&A. So with the intros, we're going to start with a quick round. Then we're going to you know, focus on your current work on the ISS, a quick intro to your company, and something that ties back to why we're all on this panel. So Paula, check that mic, see if it works. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm Paula Grisanti, and I'm CEO of the National Stem Cell Foundation. You can actually see our slide up on the screen, but we do three things. Uh, we fund adult stem cell research and regenerative medicine technologies. We uh, fund the National STEM Scholar Program, which is our workforce development program for the next generation of STEM pioneers coming along. And we help cover co-pays and deductibles for children who can't afford to do that to participate in clinical trials for rare diseases. But uh, we actually fund in four, in research, we fund in four specific areas, neurodegenerative disease, autoimmune disease, rare childhood disorders, and regenerative repair, and for us that's orthopedics. And one of the most exciting things um, that we will ever be involved in is something we've been doing for the last about five years with a research project on the International Space Station. Thank you. Um, I'm Jean Loring, I'm the other half of this team. I'm the, the research, one of the research scientists. This is a, this is a collaboration among many. Um, and we are uh, working on a, uh, studying neurodegeneration in space and actually we're interested in how microgravity affects the brain. Um, I am a professor emeritus at Scripps Research and I'm founder of Aspen Neuroscience, that works on Parkinson's disease, and a few other things because I'm, everything's, everything I do has something to do with stem cells. Hi everybody, I'm Arun Sharma. I'm an assistant professor at the Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles, California. I am predominantly a cardiovascular biologist. I use induced pluripotent stem cells to study cardiovascular disease, look at the effect of cancer drugs on the heart, and also I've been involved in this area, the bio uh, uh, research in space, biomedical research in space for the past 10 years or so utilizing induced pluripotent stem cells to model the effects of microgravity on the human heart and also utilizing uh, microgravity for biomanufacturing applications. We had an experiment that recently launched aboard the um, AX2 mission just a couple weeks ago, and I'll share a couple of results from that particular project, and uh, it just, uh, it's, a great, it's great to be here. Uh, my name is James Yu. I'm a professor at the uh, Wake Forest Institute for Regenerative Medicine, and thank you for having me in this panel. It's very exciting. Um, we got interested in space uh, research uh, back in 2016 when the uh, NASA Vascular Tissue Challenge uh, came out. Uh, you know, until then, uh, you know, we didn't think uh, space research was in my space. So uh, we're very excited. So uh, we were able to uh, successfully complete the uh, NASA uh, Vascular Tissue Challenge, and here we are. Uh, we're moving forward and advancing our uh, uh, research uh, into space. So I will share some of our approaches uh, in building tissues uh, for uh, clinical translation with you in a moment. All right, excellent. So we'll start with the uh, first. Start with the first question. Um, so, can you share more on the research that you're doing on the ISS? You want me to talk about with the slides I have? I mean, because I think all of us have that. You'd rather absolutely you want an overview first, or what? I, yeah, I think overview, and then we'll we'll go down to the ground. We'll go from space, and then we'll we'll come down. Okay. To so we've had four missions, um, and they are all designed to understand the effects of microgravity on the central nervous system. We're focusing on two different neuronal types. We're, we're creating a, a very simplified version of the brain that contains a particular type of neuron and microglia, which are the immune system cells in the brain. 
and the interaction of those two cells is involved in uh, neurodegenerative diseases of all sorts. So we're especially focused on uh, cortical neurons and dopamine neurons. The cortical neurons because of our interest in multiple sclerosis and dopamine neurons because they're affected in Parkinson's disease. So uh, we've had some really interesting results so far, but I'm not gonna go into detail about them, but they, it's, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, going from the brain to the heart, like I said, I'm a cardiovascular biologist. In 2016, I actually had the opportunity when I was a graduate student to send uh, induced pluripotent stem cell derived heart cells, meaning cardiomyocytes, heart muscle cells, to the International Space Station to model the effects of microgravity on the human heart. We know that the heart as an organ, at the organ level, changes shape and size and actually undergoes muscle atrophy during extended uh, exposure to microgravity. Uh, this is part of the reason why the astronauts actually have to constantly exercise to keep their hearts and their muscles healthy and their, their bone structures healthy as well. And so we wanted to recapitulate the effect of that uh, the effect of microgravity on the human heart at the cellular level using our stem cell derived heart cells as a model system. And again, I'm not going to go into super in depth in terms of what we found, but we're able to see that even at the cell level, uh, the effect of microgravity can, it, uh, it can mimic what happens at the organ level. So we saw a reduction in the way the, the cells actually contracted, gene expression changes as well, and these studies have actually been published uh, a couple years ago in the journal Stem Cell Reports. And most recently, we're examining uh, biomanufacturing of stem cells in microgravity, trying to harness microgravity for a positive as opposed to potentially a negative, uh, using microgravity to actually grow cardiac spheres and IPS-derived organoids as well, and also examining the whole reprogramming induced pluripotent stem cell production process in a future mission. Yeah, so uh, through uh, a vascular tissue challenge, we uh, successfully developed uh, a, a human tissue uh, that is vascularized. And uh, through, we were fortunate to uh, participate in the uh, AX2 mission recently. Uh, so we took uh, a liver tissue, bioprinted liver tissue up in space and we're, uh, you know, we just received uh, our samples uh, this week. So uh, we're very excited to see if uh, we're able to uh, enhance the development of tissues that could be, uh, you know, translated and implanted in patients uh, in the future. All right, so this is a question that, uh, you know, I get a lot myself and I think, you know, you folks up here should, you know, I think everybody's really, really wants to know so why are you working in microgravity, and why is it different? Uh, the National Stem Cell Foundation is headquartered in Louisville, Kentucky, and about an hour and 15 minutes away is Space Tango, one of the uh, space flight providers that does a lot, spends a lot of, uh, sends a lot of research to the International Space Station, and I'm also about 40 minutes from Tech Shop near Redwire in Greenville, Indiana. And about seven years ago, Chris Kemmel, who's one of the co-founders of Space Tango, called me and said, you did me a favor a few years ago, and I want to pay it forward. So if you've got research you think would benefit from a stay on the International Space Station, I'd like to help you do that. I thought he meant for free. He did not mean for free. But he, I also said, thank you very much. I have absolutely no idea what you're talking about. And he said, are you going to the World Stem Cell Summit next month? And I said, yes. And he said, while you're there, I want you to meet Jenna Studemeyer, who was then with Cases. And Jenna and I connected at that meeting. We ended up talking for two or three hours. We missed a lot of sessions we both wanted to attend. And I came out of that a complete believer. We had been funding research and trying to solve problems in our four focus areas for 15 years. And all of a sudden, I understood that with the ability to cells, see cells interact in a space in a way that's not possible on Earth, we could leapfrog what we were doing on, on Earth and solve problems more quickly, maybe solve them completely differently. And now, after four flights to the International Space Station, our last one was SpaceX 25 that splashed down in July, um, we have, this team has, developed the first human, or, human organoid model of neurodegeneration 
using organoids derived from the cells of people with Parkinson's disease and progressive MS. And there are lots of therapies out there for relaxing remitting MS. There are very, very few for progressive forms of MS. Um, and ISS National Lab and CASIS just gave us a grant to fly for a fifth time, hopefully on SpaceX 30 in January. But it is, with this model, we can better understand how these diseases develop. We may have an opportunity to look at new biomarker discovery for early diagnosis, and it definitely opens the door to new cell and gene therapy options that might affect these diseases and will have a knock-on effect for multiple other neurodegenerative diseases, including diseases of rare childhood and ALS, Alzheimer's. It's, it's one of the most exciting things that I have ever been involved in, and what we have discovered, what this team has discovered in doing this, will help millions of people. We're gonna, we're gonna do this twice, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I'm, you know, I'm really curiosity driven. I've done a lot of things with stem cells, and when Paula offered the opportunity to do something with stem cells and microgravity, I, we started the group of, of uh, people at New York Stem Cell Foundation and my lab started thinking about how we could actually study the thing that we're most interested in, which is the brain. It's very hard to study the brain of astronauts in space, so unlike the easy stuff, <laughs> we wanted to get a window into what might be happening to the brain, and so that's why we, um, we, we chose to mimic a very simplified version of the brain that had both the brain's immune system and a subtype of neurons. The brain is really complicated. It's probably just as complicated as the heart. Um, there's lots of different regions. Diseases affect different parts of the brain. So we designed experiments that would best capture the um, effects of space on, or sorry, microgravity on uh, the disease state of cells that uh, come from people with multiple sclerosis and also control people, and uh, Parkinson's disease. And that's where we're expanding from. We had amazing success on our second flight. <laughs> and so we, we developed technology that we continue to use. And so we, it, is, it is robust, um, it is unbreakable, and we always get results. So we're continuing to do it even as we expand into some more sophisticated, um, fancy experiments. Yeah, I'd agree with you. The heart's really not that complicated. <laughs> it's just a, it's a pump with four chambers. But, but there are certain aspects of the heart that are pretty exciting, one being that the individual cells of the heart actually don't regenerate themselves very well in contrast to other cell types found in the, in the human body. And so there's a lot of interest in, in using these stem cell-derived heart cells for a variety of different applications, one potentially being for cell therapy, another potentially being for drug discovery, since really this is the only way you can mass produce human heart cells outside of the body. And so for that exact reason, that's why we wanted to use these IPS stem cell derived heart cells as our model system for studying the effects of microgravity on the human heart, because there's really no other way to do this with, with human heart cells. And so that was the, the focus of the experiment in 2016, you know, examining how the negative influence of microgravity might impact the cells of the heart. But like I mentioned, I, what I'm really excited about now is the next step in using microgravity for a positive, how you can harness it for cell manufacturing, for example. And I think what Gene alluded to is that, you know, organoid production, spheroid production is one thing that's really accelerated in microgravity. That's something that's been coming up again and again and again. Even in our AX2 mission, that's something that we saw very quickly after growing these stem cells, these iPSCs in microgravity, they just naturally tend to aggregate and form these really perfect spheres. And I think there's a lot of downstream translational potential for that. Um, so that's something that I'm really excited about. Yeah, building tissue is what we do. And, uh, you know, we have been challenged by vascularization. Um, so uh, throughout uh, over the past three decades, uh, we have been trying to build tissues for, uh, you know, clinical uh, applications. And uh, although we have brought, uh, you know, multiple tissue 
uh, you know, applications to patients, when it comes to solid organs, you know, it's a totally different story. So whatever, you know, we're able to build, uh, you know, tissue structures, uh, you know, whether it is solid or, you know, uh, in structural tissues uh, outside the, the body. However, you know, the challenge comes uh, when you're trying to implant uh, and integrate into the body system. Uh, you definitely need vascularization, which would supply uh, you know, nutrients and oxygen to individual cells that are implanted. So that's uh, the challenge. And we have been struggling and trying to find uh, ways to uh, achieve that. Now, uh, with the advances in you know, so, much, so many technologies, now we're able to uh, integrate and uh, fabricate uh, vascular structures within the tissue. However, uh, the challenge is how do we deliver and deliver nutrients and oxygen to individual cells and microcapillaries are the key and uh, with the technology right now uh, on earth uh, you know we're unable to do that so through uh, space uh, microgravity environment uh, we're hoping that we could uh, address uh, the microcapillary uh, systems that could be integrated uh, into the developed tissue so that we can uh, successfully uh, manufacture uh, tissues for patients uh, of you know, different um, solid organs. All right, so <clears throat> now it's gonna be time to, to hit those slides, all right? Okay, so how will the work you're doing benefit patients on Earth? Can, can you set the slides to side yeah. mode? I mean, it doesn't really matter. But, here. but yeah, actually, I, I would like to have it because I, there's some movies in there that probably won't show up. Let's see here. Slide mode. Slideshow? Slideshow, yeah. Okay. Little picture of a slide. Okay, from the beginning. Okay. Jump up. You know? Bingo. Okay. Um, and see if that works. No, I have to point it somewhere else. It's not working. No? Okay. Let's see here. I'll just do next slide with you, okay? Yeah, you could just tell me and I'll... Uh... Oh, it looks like it may have turned itself off. There. Yeah, it looks like it may have run out of battery power. That would be All right, no guess. problem. You just, just let me know yeah. and I'll, I'll take it care of it. just went dead. Yeah. Thanks. Good to know. All right, um, we need, we need uh, like a space clicker thing here. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Or, or a battery. Uh, go ahead, please. Uh, so I want to introduce the, the team because this really is a team effort and the, the groups that initiated this uh, work were uh, scientists in my lab at Scripps Research and then Aspen Neuroscience and at Summit for Stem Cell. Uh, many projects in which we were, um, we were trying to um, develop technologies to treat Parkinson's disease and multiple sclerosis. And so you can see on the upper left, you can see some familiar faces. Uh, Paula is there, Jana is there. Um, and if you look over in the upper right-hand corner, you will see that Davide is there. Davide is in the audience. Um, we've lost him to the ISS, but he's had a critical role in developing the technology we're gonna talk about. In that, um, in that you'll, I'll show you some more pictures, but because most of this is gonna be pictures. Um, so the next slide, please. So we're working with pluripotent stem cells, which by now you should know uh, can be made from anybody. Um, IPS cells can live forever and, and they can divide forever and they can be turned into every, anything um, that you want, any cell type you want. Not necessarily easily, but eventually. We figure it out. And this is a cartoon that I love to show because it's a parental advice to a stem cell be anything you want when you grow up. And then I added that I want to be an astronaut. Next slide. So the, the, um, what we're interested in is the effects of microgravity on the brain and, and to discover whether we can create better systems for modeling brain disease that are based on, micro, on neuroinflammation. And so we uh, took advantage of the fact that we could make neurons from iPS cells. We could make microglia from iPS cells. And so we decided to combine them together in, a, in a, an organoid that would essentially serve, as, a, as I said before, a very, very simple model of part of the brain. Next slide, please. 
So I, we, we've told you we did four missions, um, and on our second mission we discovered something that turned out to be really important. And that was that um, once we formed organoids, we could place, and I'll show you this a little bit more, uh, we could make, an, make organoids, we make the microglia and the neurons from the same individual, and so there's no mismatch. And then we make aggregates um, in which develop into organoids. And then we put each one of the organoids into a single uh, one mil cryo vial and seal it up. And once we discovered that we could do that and the cells were healthy after 30 days, which I will show you, um, we found, we discovered that we could do almost anything because these cells, it was bulletproof. Um, keep going, please. These are the stages of, it's a long journey into space. This is one of the first things we learned when we, it wasn't as easy as, as I think was mentioned, going into the lab next door. Um, it was, and, and we had to learn as we went. So um, the first stage, of course, is to make the organoids and then put them in these little files. Um, they get packed up, they get sent up, uh, they get uh, eventually go up in a Falcon rocket uh, on a, in a Dragon capsule. And um, then 30 days elapse. Um, we can monitor them in a crude way so far uh, over the time they're in space, but really we're interested in what the effects are when the cells come back down. Um, so it's, um, and it involves, you know, shipping from, shipping the organoids from where they're made in, in now in New York to Cape Canaveral and then shipping them back. But we can do this, they can all be live through this entire process, which has been a real advantage for um, our studies and our imagination of what we could do next. Next slide, please. This is, I just want to show you some pictures from a couple of our uh, missions. This is the one from 2019. Um, in the upper um, left is, is Valentina and Davide from, I'm not Davide, sorry, Scott. <laughs> Scott from the uh, New York Stem Cell Foundation, and they were the ones that loaded all these organoids into the into the vials, and then they they put the vials into these special. Um, it we don't need a CO2 incubator. We don't need oxygenation. All we need is an incubator that keeps them at 37 degrees for 30 days. It's not very hard to do, and then. Uh, for this one, we got to go to the space station and watch the, the liftoff. That's Paula and Jana and me looking. We just had such a great time. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so for the next, uh, we had another one in between, and then I'm gonna tell you about the one that's most recent. And this time, I got to work in the lab, which was pretty cool, because you know, when, once you become as experienced as me. <laughs> Um, you don't get many chances to, you know, to uh, unearth your old skills. Um, so Scott um, and I were the ones who did all the work in the lab this time, and um, packed them all up. Um, had a great time. Our his his daughter and my husband came. Uh, we had to watch it from a distance because it was a night uh, launch and we couldn't go on base. But uh, the very cool thing for me about this flight is that we used my IPS cells that were made from my own skin. So I got to go up into space in a very sort of simple way. I mean, it was really easy. I didn't have to train or anything. Just made them into <laughs> organized cinema. Um, and you know, and I'm a, I'm a healthy control, just in case you're wondering. Um, and my cells are really well analyzed because we do a lot of, as you know if you've heard any of my other talks, that we do a lot of genomic analysis. And so we wanted to use cells that had been, that was my excuse, but I really just wanted to go to space. <laughs> go ahead, please. Um, so this is, what come, this is what happens when they come back. We can just dump them out of those cryovials and put them on a dish. And within one day, they've started sending these neurites out like crazy. Um, they, are, they are hyper, um, healthy after coming back down. And what we've discovered through our gene expression analysis and, and histology is that these, uh, it doesn't matter what kind of neurons they are, it doesn't matter who they came from, they are more differentiated, more mature in space than their, their, uh, the ground controls that were just, were never sent up. 
We don't know exactly why that happens, but now we have something to ask. We want to know why that happens, how it happens. But it is very consistent, and um, I'm hoping that that will be a good, that will be a very useful piece of information, not only for us to understand how neurons connect with each other, but also to make more mature neurons, um, because those are more valuable for drug drug testing, and um, and also to be able to um, understand in a in a remarkably transparent way the interaction of the immune system and the neurons. Um, in the brain, and so in our next flight, we're actually going to put, we're going to send up a, a genetic form of Parkinson's disease. The the ones we've sent up so far have all been um, sporadic cases or controls, but now we're going to try to see uh, see if it makes a difference if they're actually genetically uh, have Parkinson's disease. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is my haiku for uh, stem cells in space. And I don't know if I can actually read it from here. Uh, cosmic voyage stars. Stem cells defy gravity. <laughs> Life blooms in space and spaces embrace. And that was written by Chat GPT, which is like I've said before, best poet I've ever come across. Thank you. Okay. All right, let me get the next one off. Shifting again from the brain to the heart. They're both important. We can discuss that. We can argue. We're friends. Hold on one second. All right. Any uh, <coughs> slideshow? All right. So I'll talk a little bit about the work that I've done over the last ten-ish years. Um, ever since I was a grad student, and uh, I've been, you know, been really fortunate to be involved in multiple projects doing uh, basic science research aboard the International Space Station. Well, I'm not up there physically, maybe one day, but that's another question. We'll see. Uh, so research has been happening, and stem cell research has been happening aboard the International Space Station for 10 to 15 years now. You can see different astronauts here, uh, Jessica Mir, Peggy Whitson, Kate Rubens, uh, handling different stem cell cultures aboard the International Space Station. And actually, uh, the image from the bottom right is an, actually an image from our experiment in 2016 where we flew stem cell-derived heart cells, cardiomyocytes, into these custom six-well dishes fully enclosed. And the reason why you have to grow the cells in that format is so that, you know, in, if you use a standard six-well plate that we all use here in our laboratories on the ground, if you open up the lid, the cell culture media is going to escape into the space station and the astronauts will not be very happy. So you have to... Exactly. So you often have to approach your experiments with some custom engineering to really facilitate the science that you do in space. And again, all of this is uh, in large part thanks to support from the National Lab, from CASIS, and from NASA as well. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so what have we found in terms of the effects of microgravity um, on stem cell growth and differentiation of function? Well, there's quite a bit that happens and a lot has been replicated using microgravity simulators on the ground as well, simulated microgravity. It's not a perfect analog as to what, to, compared to what you would experience in true microgravity in low Earth orbit, but there are changes that happen to stem cell differentiation, proliferation, production, and a, a lot of these, the caveat with a lot of these experiments, if you advance forward, is if you, yeah, if you want to move it forward one, so, you know, cellular mechanic sensing, proliferation, differentiation are altered in microgravity, but the caveat being a lot of these experiments are difficult to replicate. And as Gene alluded to, these are very difficult experiments to do in, in orbit. Uh, one thing that we want to go into the future is perhaps improve the throughput and incorporate automation into these experiments so that we can increase our end values, replicate these results a bit more. But one thing that has been consistent, I think, over the course of the last 10 years is the ability to, for example, facilitate three-dimensional cell culture. That's one thing that microgravity is really good at, at doing. And in some situations, stem cell proliferation has also been enhanced in microgravity. And a lot of other interesting observations as well. If you want to go to the next slide. So in 2016, I sent a sample of stem cell-derived cardiomyocytes, heart muscle cells, to the International Space Station, as I described. Uh, this is just a schematic of how this experiment you know, comes about and how it, how it works. You have your experiment that you sent to the space station, but you also always want to have a set of ground-side controls, something that you can compare your space results to. So we had 
uh, cells that were growing in our lab at Stanford and also the cells that were growing in space. If you want to go to the next. Um, and so this is just some images from the experiment. The cells were launched aboard a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket, as you can see in the top left there. They were received and uh, handled by astronaut Kate Rubens. It was really great to work with her because not only is she a NASA astronaut, but she's also a cell biologist in her former career. She actually used to be a PI at the Whitehead Institute in Boston before she got sick of uh, writing grants all day and then ultimately decided to become an astronaut, so it worked out. Uh, and then, like I mentioned before, the, um, uh, the image on the bottom right is Kate holding our IPS-derived cardiomyocyte sample. And I'm not going to go into the details in terms of what we found, but we published our results a few years ago showing that these cells respond really nicely to the environment that they're placed in. They actually contract less in orbit, one of the interesting findings that we saw. Next, next slide. But there's a lot of room in, for improvement, as I alluded to, uh, if you just want to advance it forward. Automation of processes. This is a big uh, next step for us. We want to be able to incorporate automated approaches to minimize crew time. So the astronauts are really busy. They're not only exercising, but they're also doing so many other biomedical and non-biomedical research experiments aboard the ISS. If we incorporate automated approaches, we can uh, reduce their workload and also perhaps improve the reproducibility of our experiments. Uh, better multi-lineage cell models. There's a bunch of new exciting model technologies in stem cell biology these days that we're hoping to incorporate into the next iteration of our experiments. You know, Gene alluded to some of these organoids, organ on chips, tissue engineering approaches like Dr. Yu is talking about. Uh, if you want to go next. And scalability and in in-orbit cell production. This is also something we're really interested in. Uh, in part to improve the experimental reproducibility, can we do a high throughput version of these experiments? Instead of a six well plate, can we scale up to say a 1536 well plate, something that a drug company would be able to uh, use in parallel with some of their ground control experiments? And can we explore biomanufacturing possibilities? Things that we could actually only do in microgravity where microgravity could facilitate the manufacturing of stem cells or their products. Next slide. So in the AX2 mission, which just launched uh, very recently, we wanted to explore this possibility of biomanufacturing, exploring stem cell manufacturing in microgravity. Can the production, transfection, or differentiation of induced pluripotent stem cells be improved by microgravity? Next. And this is our uh, just a, a schematic of the approach that we're taking for this NASA-funded project. It's going to incorporate three different missions, three different flights over the course of the next uh, two years. We're going to be examining stem cell differentiation, reprogramming, and also uh, differentiation, reprogramming, and proliferation and transfection. These are what we're going to be examining in the course of these uh, next few experiments over the course of the next two years. Next. Also exploring high throughput imaging of modalities for evaluating all alterations in stem cell properties in microgravity. Next. And what we like to refer to this as a set of reference missions, missions that the stem cell community could go back and refer back to in terms of uh, looking at our data points and seeing if their data points for future missions are able to match up with the results that we get. Again, in, in hopes of improving reproducibility in this field. Next. Um, so the Axiom 2 mission, which again launched just about two weeks ago, was examining the first portion of this greater NASA project basically looking at the proliferation and DNA transfection of two different cell types, induced pluripotent stem cells, and also fibroblasts that were differentiated from the induced pluripotent stem cells. And this is setting up for a future mission looking at the full IPS production reprogramming process in space. Next. And so this is an example of the IPS line, induced pluripotent stem cell line that we're working with. It actually is really exciting to work with because it, it expresses a, a green fluorescent protein, GFP, in the SOX2, uh, uh, attached to the SOX2 protein in the nucleus of the cells. And you can see in red is our ground side control of the DNA plasmid actually being introduced into the cells. The DNA plasmid is expressing, expressing a red protein. Next. And so, I'll sh just like Jane, I'll show some examples of how you prepare, some images of how you prepare for these experiments that ultimately go into space. So you can see a familiar image from the top middle right there. That's the International Space Station Processing F Facility, or SSPF, where you do a lot of your prep work in advance of putting your cells on the, the rocket. That's actually my team from about three weeks ago 
uh, working in cell culture in Kennedy Space Center down in Florida, preparing the cells to be placed on the SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. Next. And these are just some images from the launch that I thought were fun to, to look at. Some familiar faces you may or may not be able to see uh, down there, but we have Jana, who's in the audience, who is also, uh, Jana's everywhere, as if you haven't figured it out by now. Um, and that's uh, Administrator uh, Nelson from NASA talking about our experiments and also just a few other slides that were, that were shown at the presentation down in Kennedy Space Center. Next. And I'm not gonna talk too much about the, the results, which were very exciting. We're actually getting ready to, to submit a manuscript on them pretty soon. But these are just some images of the NASA astronauts, sorry, the Axiom astronauts, who are floating around in space and also doing experiments, uh, growing our, our iPSCs induced pluripotent stem cells aboard the uh, um, Life Sciences glove box that's found on the International Space Station. We have Peggy Whitson, who is a legendary NASA astronaut, Axiom astronaut, who has the, the world, the American record for time in space, who's part of the team. Uh, Rayana Bernawi, who is really critically involved in our experiment, uh, and other astronauts as well. So it's a really, truly collaborative mission to be a part of, and we're very excited to share our results pretty soon. Next. And uh, I'll wrap up there just saying that the ISS in low Earth orbit is accessible. It's a unique environment for stem cell research and development, which is happening as we speak. Next. Uh, IPSCs and their derivative, whether it's heart cells, brain cells, can be cultured long-term in low-Earth orbit with changes that happen to their gene expression, gene function, cell function, happening within days uh, many times. And biomanufacturing is currently being explored through commercial, governmental, and academic collaboration. But I think the, the last point, if you want to go to the next point, the last thing I want to leave you with is that there's still a lot of basic science data that uh, you know, needs to be to really fully determine the full potential of growing stem cells in space. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of work that still has to happen at the basic science level here. And so I'll, I'll wrap up right there. Okay, um, I would like to transition from cells and organoids to actual uh, tangible tissues. <laughs> All right. <laughs> No, 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 we're collaborating. <laughs> All right, so, uh, so uh, my talk is based on the, uh, the vascular tissue challenge program uh, to develop a 3D bioprinted vascularized liver tissue construct uh, for eventual use in patients. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, you know, somehow um, NASA's vascular tissue challenges goal was, you know, completely aligned with our goal of developing uh, vascularized tissues. You know, vascularization, uh, you know, has been a challenge for forever. Uh, and we have been struggling, you know, although there have been uh, advances made, uh, you know, it's not uh, to the point where uh, it is completely entirely satisfactory. So uh, we wanted to uh, develop uh, a uh, vascularized liver tissue uh, in vitro that could uh, you know, survive for a long term. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, you know, if the vascular tissue challenge came out way before, uh, you know, 2016 or maybe 10 years before, we would not be able to, uh, you know, uh, compete uh, on it. Uh, because uh, there are technologies that are necessary to uh, develop a pre you know a, a tissue structures uh, with precision and reproducibility and bioprinting technology allows us to do that it can scale up uh, and you can print uh, a sizable clinically relevant size uh, tissue structures with precision and reproducibility that we could not replicate with uh, our hands. So next slide, please. So uh, we have been working on bioprinting uh, technology for over, uh, you know, 
almost 20 years now, and we're able to uh, develop different uh, tissue systems uh, from soft tissue to hard tissue, uh, simpler tissue to more complex uh, tissues as you see uh, here. So using that technology, we were able to uh, uh, you know, challenge uh, in addressing uh, the, uh, the you know, uh, vascularized tissues. Next slide, please. So the uh, you know, vascular tissue challenge program itself had a very strict, uh, you know, requirements, uh, you know, uh, requiring you to build a uh, you know, large, sizable tissue greater than one centimeter in all dimensions, uh, and they need to be vascularized and composed of human cells, uh, you know, and kept for. Uh, over a long time, you know, up to 30 days. And uh, the most important thing is that the cells, uh, you know, within the uh, tissue construct need to be functional, uh, comparable to humans. So, uh, so uh, you know, we really uh, internally have thought about, you know, how we can, you know, how could we, uh, you know, achieve this goal? And, you know, there are many different designs that we have uh, considered, and for this particular program, we have uh, decided to use uh, the gyroid design where, uh, you know, multiple channels are in interconnected. So if we were to build a tissue, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, you know, nutrients and um, oxygen could be supplied uh, and available to cells uh, readily. So, uh, you know, this uh, design is similar to uh, our human corporal tissue, which is very highly vascularized tissue with uh, erectile function. Uh, so uh, we have modeled that uh, design and used a DLP printer to uh, print uh, liver cells. Uh, in uh, one by one by one uh, centimeter dimension um, to meet the requirements. And then uh, after we printed uh, the liver cells, we have coated the, the uh, channels uh, with endothelial cells or vascular cells in order uh, to prevent uh, clotting. Uh, so uh, we uh, have printed uh, the construct, and then in order to maintain that over a long term, we have uh, hooked it up, uh, connected uh, the construct into a perfusion system uh, where uh, nutrients and oxygen uh, are supplied, uh, you know, continuously for over 30 days, uh, as you see there. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so. Uh, and what we found, uh, you know, throughout all time points, we have looked at uh, the construct at 10 days, 20 days, and 30 days. And, uh, you know, over time, those individual single cells that were delivered uh, through the nozzle uh, of the printer uh, are uh, able to organize and form uh, more like a uh, aggregate, uh, you know, something similar, not entirely, uh, you know, to the tissue level, but uh, they uh, aggregated and uh, they survived uh, over the entire uh, testing period. And so we looked at uh, liver cells individually and then uh, endothelial cells or vascular cells. And uh, we were able to show that the, uh, the vascular cells uh, that are covering the channel uh, are you know, completely uh, covered uh, showing that the uh, vascularization is feasible, uh, you know, through this experiment. And more importantly, you know, well, what about the function? Yes, we can make uh, tissues structurally, but are they functional? And so we uh, looked at uh, albumin and bilirubin, you know, they, they are uh, produced by liver, and we were able to show that the uh, the level of their secretion and production is pretty similar to uh, human uh, liver tissue. Not quiet, but you know, pretty similar. Uh, next slide, please. 
So, uh, you know, as you can see, uh, we successfully developed a vascularized thick, uh, liver tissue that maintains me uh, their metabolic function over a period of 30 days, and uh, hepatocytes uh, within the construct produce albumin and bilirubin, uh, you know, showing the metabolic uh, functionality. And we do think that, uh, you know, this is not, uh, you know, uh, entirely limited to liver, but uh, this approach and this platform could be expanded to other solid organ systems. Next, please. So, uh, so uh, using that, uh, you know, we uh, wanted to see uh, what space can do for us. Uh, you know, we wanted to de uh, determine how the vascularized tissue construct created on Earth uh, are affected by uh, zero gravity. Uh, and we want to better understand uh, the mechanism involved in uh, vascularization, develop, tissue development, and maturation uh, in a solid organ system. Uh, and uh, more importantly, we want to uh, see if we can create uh, capillary-like uh, capillary structures that could infiltrate and penetrate, uh, you know, within the tissue, so that uh, you know the uh, biofabricated, uh, you know, large channels could deliver, and then uh, those, uh, you know, nutrients and oxygen could be uh, effectively delivered to individual cells. So. Um, you know, creating that uh, kind of uh, organ system would, you know, may serve as a bridge to transplantation. That's what we're hoping. Next slide, please. So we were, you know, uh, very fortunate and ecstatic about, uh, you know, bringing, uh, you know, creating, developing this uh, tissue construct and uh, look at, uh, you know, uh, as a pilot experiment for a short-term uh, you know, uh, fly to see how cells be behave. So, uh, you know, we have uh, used the same cells and uh, same design uh, using the same printer, uh, cre replicated uh, a uh, liver tissue construct and uh, sent it off to uh, the uh, AX2 mission. And, uh, you know, I'm, uh, you know, it's, it's, I'm sorry that uh, we don't have the results uh, to share with you, but perhaps uh, next time uh, somewhere else uh, or this evening. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, but, you know, what are we, uh, you know, expecting? Uh, you know, we want to use, utilize a micro uh, gravity environment to enhance the formation of a microcapillary system within the bioprinted vascularized tissue construct for eventual biomanufacturing uh, for clinical applications. And we want to, uh, you know, uh, continue to develop and validate this platform that would support as a, uh, you know, tissue block that could be used uh, for transplantation, uh, you know, um, someday. Thank you so much. Oh, oh, yes, next slide. Yes, yes, you know, this cannot be uh, done uh, alone or, you know, few individuals. I mean, it takes a, uh, a village uh, to achieve this. And I would like to uh, thank all our uh, team members and our partners and sponsors that support, uh, you know, our cause uh, and a common cause uh, to uh, improve human health. Uh, especially, I would like to thank uh, Kelsey Wilson, uh, uh, Tim Dobrowski, and Gino Jung, who uh, have, uh, you know, really uh, worked uh, day and night, uh, weekdays and weekends, 24-7. And uh, special thanks to uh, Jenna uh, for guiding us uh, into, uh, you know, more work. <laughs> thank you so much. Next, next slide, please. Yes. Uh, this is the last slide. You know, of course, uh, I would like to uh, thank our institute members uh, who uh, really support the cause, uh, a common uh, mission uh, to develop regenerative medicine technologies to uh, help improve patients' health. Thank you so much. All right. Now, look, uh, I know we ran over time. I uh, started this one a little later. We're still running out of time. So what I'm thinking about on final thoughts is I'm going to seed that final thought with the bonus question. All right. So 
you didn't really lose much. So it's, it's not free, free thought, so it's sort of like not free thought, okay? So your, your final thought is going to be, so how will the contributions from work in microgravity on the ISS or future commercial space stations advance the field of regenerative medicine? Okay, uh, since I have the mic, um, uh, I'll start. Uh, really, uh, you know, this is the first time, uh, you know, to my knowledge that a, uh, an actual tissue construct, uh, you know, has been uh, tested uh, in space. So, I, you know, we really do not know what to expect. We would like to expect uh, that we could, uh, you know, form a better tissue faster, you know, so that we can uh, readily use it, uh, you know, in, uh, you know, on Earth, really. And I think, uh, you know, developing tissue maturation, uh, maturation uh, in the space uh, is one thing, but, you know, maybe someday we could manufacture uh, an implantable tissue and that exit to the Earth and uh, use it uh, in patients. You know, that's um, uh, probably not in my lifetime, but uh, that's, I'm very hopeful. Yeah, I'd like to agree with that. I think harnessing microgravity's potential for, for good is what I'm the most excited about. Utilizing microgravity for biomanufacturing applications and potentially finding that, quote, killer app that we can only do in space and that we can't do on the ground. So is there a, a tissue construct? Is there an organoid, a vascularized organoid that can only be facilitated, its formation can only be facilitated in space? That's, that's what intrigues me. And I think within the next five to 10 years, we'll be able to find that quote killer app and then use it, whatever we're able to manufacture in space for translational applications on the ground, for cell therapy, for disease modeling, for drug toxicity screening. So you know, I just wanted to leave, leave you with that. That's the thing that excites me the most, is a thing that you can only do in space. Yeah, I'll just add one more thing from my experiences. So my company, Aspen Neuroscience, is doing um, GMP manufacturing now for the, uh, the uh, clinical trial, phase one clinical trial. And what really strikes me is that there's so much we've learned from designing of instrumentation and autonomous systems, I mentioned this before, um, reproducibility, um, hands-off, um, also for training. It is really challenging to, to make the same product in the GMP suite that you made in the lab. And I think uh, we've been inspired by what we've managed to learn about uh, how to design instruments in space. And that's feeding back into our knowledge of, and I think will improve, our abilities to do my biomanufacturing on Earth as well. I think what I can tell you is that the research we're doing in LEO has leapfrogged uh, much of what we've been able to accomplish over the last 15 years doing research on the Earth. Um, and I can, I can tell you about the human and financial impact of this research, and that is there are uh, millions of people out there who suffer from Parkinson's disease and, and MS. The economic cost to the U.S. alone, the annual economic cost, is $137 billion and you add in maybe the knock-on effect for other neurodegenerative diseases like ALS or Alzheimer's, it's inestimable. And these are diseases that affect a significant portion of the global population. I hope, I hope with this research, with all of this research, we can solve these problems for everybody who has these diseases and many others we haven't talked about today. All right, so we'll have time for a small Q&A, but my final thought is just remember that space is the killer app for regenerative medicine. Keep that in mind. Any questions? So on behalf of Methuselah Foundation, we really thank you for the work that all of you have done uh, around this. Um, it just makes sense in extending healthy human life. It also extends out into space. Uh, but my quick question is, what, uh, if, can you mention any work streams that are in flight on the ISS or, or elsewhere, like with Axiom or uh, other companies that you're aware of, 
um, that takes the work of the vascular tissue challenge even further. Oh. I don't quite, uh, you know, fully understand your question. Um, but I guess, uh, you know, I got, you know, they handed me the mic because uh, the key word, vascular tissue challenge. Uh, but uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, the information that we can get, uh, gain from previous studies, uh, you know, from uh, ISS, uh, you know, national labs is uh, based on uh, cellular work, cellular behavior, and, uh, you know, to a certain degree, uh, like tissue aggregates and organoid systems. But, uh, you know, we're, uh, you know, I think uh, the uh, area of, uh, you know, tissue construct is uh, very brand new because uh, it's structured. It's very different from uh, cells or organoids. It's structured uh, and it is, uh, it uses uh, biomaterials. So cellular behavior and their interaction in uh, the uh, ECM or uh, you know structured biomaterial uh, you know may be different. I don't know. So uh, yes, we're taking you know all the information we've gathered, and but you know that will be limited. So uh, we have to work with our imagination and you know and part hope uh, to see uh, what happens. So we're you know uh, we don't know what to expect. And we hope that uh, any findings uh, that would lead us to, uh, you know, better developing uh, tissues for, you know, human uh, civilization. So I guess to, to build on that, I think um, tissue printing is something that's, in my mind, one of the most exciting applications that's being investigated in microgravity, just because the, the fundamental properties that are utilized to print tissues are completely different in microgravity, like sedimentation properties are very different. Uh, and this allows you to create constructs, vascularized constructs, three-dimensional constructs that you may not be able to do on the ground, just because that, that microgravity presence allows you to, to, you know, uh, to be more creative in the way you develop these constructs. So I think there's, there's other groups that are printing different types of tissues on orbit. There have been 3D printers that have been aboard the International Space Station, bioprinters. So this is definitely a very hot area of investigation. I really don't have anything to add. This absolutely, we're, we're, we don't know exactly where this is going, but I, I think the lack of gravity is something we've never really considered before in our experiments. and I, I think you can tell by just listening to us that this is inspiring for us. They think, what, what happens when you don't have a lot of gravity? And can you do something more important or more interesting? And I guess really what it comes down to is we're just curious. Uh, may I add, add uh, one comment? Uh, you know, when we uh, develop tissues uh, on Earth uh, under gravity, uh, you know, everything sags, right? So uh, set, uh, cells uh, sag and they do uh, settle down. Uh, so, you know, so are the materials. So, uh, you know, that's uh, one of the challenges. You know, there are, uh, you know, better biomaterials that uh, could uh, serve as a microenvironment for cells, uh, but uh, because of flexibility, uh, you know, it would not support its uh, own weight, so it sags. So uh, in uh, in the space, you know, I you know we do expect uh, that uh, you know the uh, structure will be maintained, uh, but more importantly, the cells will be uniformly distributed throughout the construct rather than uh, you know um, sagging, uh, you know, to the bottom. So. Uh, we do think that uh, we would have uh, a uh, uniform uh, tissue structure with uniform distribution of cells uh, and place cells, uh, you know, where cells would be where we, they would uh, belong. All right, well, well, that's it for panel two. Uh, see you in about five, ten minutes. Yeah. Thank you.